certainly is a pleasure to be with you today. And she gave a little bit of uh, history about who I am. I, I'm a graduate of Gulf Coast Bible College down in Houston, Texas, now Mid-American Bible College, way back in 1976. And I was ordained in ministry in uh, uh, 1979 out of West Virginia. And then did youth in music ministry in uh, West Virginia and Pennsylvania for six years and then on to the island of Guam for uh, just under four years and then pastor two churches in Northern California. So uh, that's who I am and uh, who God has made me. And uh, one of the things we did is we moved to Vancouver two years ago and uh, to be close to our granddaughter who moved to Portland from California. She had three grandkids right away. Four, three, and one. So that's why we're here. <laughs> they needed a babysitter. <laughs> but then uh, after we moved here just last this past summer, our son from Monterey, California moved up here. So I have both of my children here. And we're enjoying our five grandsons in the area. Um, so we're enjoying Vancouver and getting to know Washington. We haven't had a lot of time to get around with COVID. I mean, we kind of stuck home. And, and uh, but now we're getting around and I've enjoyed the opportunity to share with you in several churches in uh, Portland and in the Washington area. So I want to share a story with you first, knowing your situation, knowing that your pastor left in January, and knowing what you're going through as a congregation is always a difficult time. At the same time, it's an exciting time in which God is at work to bring to you a partner in ministry that will not only bless you, but bless your community, and bless this, this state, and this, this, the whole world as you reach out uh, in ministry to those. But I came across a story I wanted to share with you. Uh, one Sunday morning, a small southern church, the new pastor, called on one of his older deacons to lead an opening prayer. The deacon stood up, bowed his head, and said, Lord, I hate buttermilk. <laughs> the pastor opened one eye and wondered, where is this going? The deacon continued, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was totally perplexed. But the deacon continued, Lord, I ain't too crazy about plain flour, but after you mix them all together and bake them in a hot oven, I just love biscuits. <laughs> Lord, help us realize when things get hard, when things come up that we don't like, wherever we don't understand what you're doing, that we need to wait and see what you are making. After you get through mixing and baking, it'll probably be something even better than biscuits. Isn't that the picture of the church? God brings us together with all sorts of personalities, cultural backgrounds, life experiences, opinions and preferences. And he puts us together as a body of Christ, mixing our gifts and our talents and our abilities and making something beautiful that brings glory and honor to him. And it is sometimes our distinct differences brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit that exalts our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and gives hope to a lost and dying world. When I was in Santa Cruz County, I had the opportunity to be on the leadership council for the uh, Santa Cruz County Evangelical Menace Fellowship. And Chip Ingram was one of the pastors there. I don't know if you've heard of Chip. He was uh, walked through the Bible a teacher, uh, uh, a manager. But he was one of the pastors in Santa Cruz County. And he made this statement, which I love. There's probably about 30 or 40 churches represented from the county at that meeting. And he said this, we are one church. Now, these are churches from a lot of different denominations. He said, we are one church. We don't compete against each other. We don't need to compare against each other. We don't need to copy each other. We are each unique as churches, but we are one church. And our primary focus is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? Isn't that the way we should? And that's, that's really one of the tenets of the Church of God that was formed as a movement, not as a denomination. That we're just all one in Christ. And the gospel should be the focus. 
And we don't need to compete with another church. We don't need to compare ourselves to other churches. We don't need to try to copy other churches. I know when I was at a church in California, we were doing kind of a reassessment of who we were as a church and what ministries and things we could offer because there's all these churches in the city and, uh, you know, different worship styles, whether it's traditional or contemporary or somewhere in between, uh, children's ministry, youth ministry, senior adult ministries, and, and we were talking about all these things and we came to the conclusion, well, almost every church we know does these things. And then Paul Kessler, a very good friend of mine, said, what makes our church unique? We do. No other church has us. <laughs> right? They may do all the other things that we want to do or we like to do or we are doing, but they don't have us. We are what makes us unique. And I want you to know that as a church. You are what makes this church special. And when you find that pastor that God is calling and partnering with him, God has tremendous things in store for you. And I, we have been praying ever since Paul Wilson told me that you were without a pastor and been on your prayer list that God would bless you and lead you to the person he has in store for you. Okay. Now I guess I can preach. <laughs> There are times in life when we all have that sinking feeling, don't you? Ever been there? Things seem to be going downhill and downhill fast. We're not sure we're going to survive, especially with things that have been happening today with COVID. And now there's inflation, supply chain issues, empty shelves in store. I've seen more empty shelves than I've ever seen in my lifetime in stores today. Skyrocketing fuel costs, partisan politics, and now even more in Ukraine. We're living in difficult, depressing, and dangerous times. But I want to share with you a story before I get into the message from my son-in-law's sister. She was in Las Vegas when they had that big music festival and the shots were raining down, killing many people. She was there in the crowd. The next day, she did a Facebook post. This is what she said. All day, I've been struggling to find the words to express the absolute rushing emotional anguish of last night and today. The scene was a straight up war zone, and I will never forget the feeling of complete helplessness being pinned down as shots continued relentlessly all around us. As we first realized what was happening and ran to escape, one of those shots struck Jenna, who was tremendously brave and strong and recovering in stable condition at the hospital right now. I have decided I would list some of the things I am thankful for. I am thankful for the strangers who helped Nina and I with Jenna as we fled the venue. I am thankful for first responders who shielded us with vehicles and protected us once we made it to the street. I am thankful for the safety of my friends and family who made it to safe, to, made it safety to cover, jumping over fences, running and, running and hiding the best we could. I am thankful for Nina's composure and strength as we attempted to find an ambulance for her sister, helping keep Jenna calm, focused, and alert. And I found out later that they found an ambulance. They got her into the ambulance and were getting ready to go to the hospital when they stopped the ambulance and took her out because there was someone who was wounded even more. And so they had to find another way to get her to the hospital. I am thankful for the hospital staff at the University Medical Center for helping Jenna when we could no longer do anything. I am thankful Jenna is surrounded by friends and family as she makes her recovery. That bullet could have hit any of us. I am thankful. I am thankful. Hug your loved ones closer and pray for a better world than this. How does someone deal with this? 57 dead, over 400 injured, and a personal friend among the wounded. And yet maintaining an attitude of thankfulness. I'm sure the emotions are overwhelming. Fear, anger, bitterness, retribution, so many directions 
Her emotions could have gone, but upon reflecting upon the tragedy and trauma of that event, she settles on thankfulness. Seeing tragedy and trauma, as I talked to her, I told her how I felt. She saw tragedy and trauma through the eyes of faith. That's the lens that she used. She could have looked in many different directions, but she chose to see this through the eyes of faith. To have faith, to be thankful, to have hope. She's a young lady that distributed a lot of maturity in her faith. We've all been there. It's been a struggle. And God has something to say to us about going through struggles in life. Psalm 77, I want to share it with you. The first 15 verses. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord at night and stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. I remember you, O God, and I groaned. I mused in my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart mused and my spirit inquired. Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeem your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Let's pray. Father, May your Holy Spirit come down. Settle in this place. Rest upon those who are here. Speak not only to our minds, but to our hearts. Reveal in us the truth that you have for us today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the psalmist has experienced similar emotions which we are going through today. And we hear his lament, we hear his cry of sorrow, of regret. He had, a, he had that sinking feeling that things just weren't going the way they're supposed to go. And he goes and expresses them in writing. And I think many of us, not all of us, have felt as the psalmist did at some point in our lives. And it's, this, this song to me is a reminder of how to face that sinking feeling. How to face when doubt comes into your life. Because it's going to come. Because the life is hard. There's no question about that. Life is hard. But let's look at his emotional response to whatever is going on in his life. He doesn't give any indication of what's happening, but he's telling him us what his emotions are about what's going on. Verse 1 through 3, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. That night I stretched out my untiring hands, that same praying, and my soul refused to be comforted. I remember you, O God, and I groaned, I mused, and my fear grew faint. You know what he was feeling? God, you're ignoring me. You're ignoring me. Have you ever felt ignored? What a, I mean, just anything that would get you upset and angry. It's when people just ignore you, or if your wife ignores you, or your husband ignores you, or you're trying to correct your kids and all they do is ignore you, which they're good at. When you're being ignored, you come to the conclusion that they don't care. And that's what the psalmist says, I'm in distress. God doesn't care. Can't you see, God, I'm in trouble. I'm praying to you. And you're not listening. You're not answering. It's frustrating. And the psalmist appeals to God but finds no comfort. He says, I find no comfort in being ignored and unanswered. So that's his first emotion. 
He's the Lord. Verse 4. He kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. Insomnia. I can't sleep. I can't sleep worrying about the future, worrying about my finances, worrying about my health, worrying about the family, worrying about my relationship with you, worrying about this pandemic, worrying about inflation, worrying about this war. I can't sleep. You're filled with so much anxiety and distress to the point you not only can't sleep, you don't even know what to say anymore. You're so worn out by life circumstances that you can't get any rest. You can't put it into words. You don't even know what to say anymore. He doesn't stop there, verses 5 and 6. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remember my songs in the night, my heart mused, thinking about the past. You ever come to the point where you say, the best days are behind me. They're gone. Yeah. The good old days are gone. The past is so much better than the future. And over and over in his mind, he's replaying the better days like a broken record. And what does it do? It only leads to frustration, maybe even anger, bitterness, resentment, depression. So he's feeling ignored. He's feeling insomnia. He's feeling the best days are gone. Verses 7 through 9. My spirit inquired, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Here it is, rejection. God, I just feel like you rejected me. Unloved. Broken promises. No mercy, no compassion, no favor. What's he feeling? He's feeling abandoned by God. Negativity rules, pessimism reigns. Those emotions are the constant, are his constant compassion. So let me sum, sum it up this way. I put it down. One, I feel like praying does no good. I can't sleep or talk about it. I dwell on how good things used to be with no hope for their return. And I fear God doesn't care and things will never get better. That sums up his emotions. He was experiencing a horrible, no good, very bad day, week, month, maybe like us, the past couple of years. Been there, done it, doubt. He's filled with doubt. And doubt is like an earthquake in our lives. It shakes the very foundation upon which our house is built. It shakes the foundation of our faith in God. When doubt overwhelms us, we can spiral down into the depths of depression. And that sinking feeling overwhelms you and you go from doubt to fear to anxiety to despair to depression, which eats away at your faith in God. Now I want to say something about doubt here, something that I've learned personally about doubt. God allows it because God wants to use your doubt. Not to defeat you, not to depress you, but to lead you to a confirmation of your faith. So don't fear doubt. You see, faith is revealed in how you deal with doubt. That shows you where your faith is. So it's hard, but can we welcome doubt as an opportunity to affirm faith? You see, when doubt comes, it can drive us to God, right? We turn even more to God as all these doubts start to crop up in our lives. And I believe that's why God allows doubt sometimes to come in our lives, because it eventually drives us to faith, and that's a good thing. God can use doubt to increase your faith. On the other hand, the evil one wants to take your doubt and twist it in such a way that it drives you away from God. It's the same with guilt. You know, some people say, we don't want to feel guilty. Oh, that's a terrible thing. God can use guilt to what? To acknowledge you've done something wrong and seek to make it right. 
So don't be afraid of guilt. Sometimes that's the Holy Spirit working in your lives trying to turn you to the truth, to turn you to doing right, to turn you to repentance. And yet, so it means, oh, I don't like that feeling. How you receive guilt makes all the difference in your future. When you see it as an opportunity for God to work in your life, good. Or do you allow the evil one to twist it, to defeat you? But here's the big question I think that the psalmist is wrestling with in these verses. The big question that he is asking himself when he talks about his insomnia and he talks about uh, being ignored and the better days are gone and rejection. The big question that he's asking himself that he may not even realize is this. Has my God changed? This is what I believe about God. This is who I believe he was. And now suddenly things are going this way. Has God changed? It's a tough question. Has God changed? Everything the psalmist has known, experienced, and learned about God is suddenly in doubt. He's struggling. God can change. Are you real? And it's promising the way my life is going now, I'm not so sure I can count on you. If God has changed, then he fears I've lost his favor, I've lost his love, I've lost his promises, I've lost his grace, I've lost his compassion. He's at a tipping point in his relationship with God, and he has to choose whether he's going to have faith in the God he has known or decide that the God isn't who he thought he was. So, he moves on, and here's this transition. For those of you who may be facing doubt, despair now, the Psalms reveals it. Look at verses 10 through 15. Then I thought. He lays out all his doubts, all his struggles, and he finds, then I thought. To this I will appeal. The years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works, and I will consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O oh God, are holy. What God is so great is our God. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people with your mighty arm. You redeem your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Let me tell you, God has something special for you. He has a gift for you. If you're there right now, living in doubt, or if you find yourself living down the future, He has given you the gift of memory. See, He stops and He says, I thought. I remember. Listen to this, the brain capacity. The human brain, according to Stanford 2010 article in Scientific American, the memory capacity of the human brain is reported to have the equivalent of 2.5 petabytes of memory capacity. As a number of petabyte means 1,024 terabytes or a million gigabytes. So the average adult human brain has the ability to store the equivalent of 2.5 billion gigabytes digital memory. Wow. God gave us an amazing ability of the brain to remember. So memory is not a problem. Except when you're 68 years old and you walk from the living room to the kitchen, you can't remember why you went there or what you went there for. But I can still remember some things when I was five years old. Isn't that amazing? That we have this capacity of memory that is so amazing. And the, the, the question is, what do we do with that memory? And the psalmist had to stop himself if he goes on this rant of negativity and he has to pause and say, I, I need to stop and remember who God is and what he has been in my life. You see, God's intent is to allow the Holy Spirit to guide 
you discovering and knowing the truth. Remembering his unconditional love, remembering his forgiveness, remembering his faithfulness, his presence, his power, his protection, his provision, his mercy and grace. When you're in that feeling of that sinking feeling of doubt creeping in, God wants you to stop and remember. On the other hand, Satan's intent is to take your memory, to steal, to kill, to destroy, to twist all these things in your mind to the point that you move to, from doubt to depression to defeat and eventually death. Those times of doubt can come and be overwhelmed, but stop and think. Remember, choose to constantly focus on God and not how you feel. In verse 9, the first nine verses of that psalm, what the, what the psalmist is doing is he focuses on his feelings. Pronouns such as I, me, or mine are used 18 times all focusing on the writer's feelings about how his life is going. From verses 10 to 20, the focus turns not from I, me, or my, to God, you and yours. He makes a transition from feelings to faith. The key to overcoming that sinking feeling, to defeating those feelings of abandonment, confusion, doubt, helplessness, depression, anger, bitterness, and negativity is to use God's gift of memory. Use the power of your God gift of memory to overcome your feelings. You see, the psalmist said, I will appeal. That's a legal term. I will appeal. You know, like they do in Christ, I will appeal. I will appeal to God. I will remember. I will meditate. I will consider all these things that God has been in my life in the past. Not focus on the feelings, but what I know God is, has done, and is in my life. And the psalmist is doubting at one point, but not denying God. That's something we need to learn. Doubt's going to come. Don't deny God. Use your memory as a constant choice. God has proven himself. We confirm that when we choose to remember. We can remember how gracious God has been. We can remember how loving he has been. We can remember how forgiving he has been, how merciful he has been, how powerful he has been, how he has healed, how he has redeemed, and how he continues to do good in our lives. And for us today, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. He has not changed. Amen. As a country, we're reeling from the tragic events of this past couple of years. Life has been hard. We have been isolated from each other. And that's one thing about being a part of the family of God. Touch is so important. But we've been isolated, and it's, it's painful. And emotionally, we're worn out, we're drained of all our energy and strength, and confused about your future. And some of you, if you're there doubting or struggling with that, and you're thinking, what does the future hold for me? I want to share another story with you. It happened in 2015. There was a tragic workplace shooting. And this is a story of 26-year-old Denise Peraza. Her life was spared, not because the shooter saw her and turned the other way, but because a valiant 45-year-old co-worker named Shannon Johnson, a Christian, shielded her body with his own and saved her life while sacrificing her own. She was, once, she was shot once in the lower back. Listen, listen to her account. Wednesday morning at 10.55 a.m. We were seated next to each other at a table, joking about how we thought the large clock on the wall might be broken because time seemed to be moving so slowly. I would have never guessed that only five minutes later we would be huddled next to each other 
under the same table, using a fallen chair as a shield from over 60 rounds of bullets being fired across the room. While I cannot remember every single second that played out that morning, I will always remember his left arm wrapped around me, holding me as close as possible next to him behind the chair. And amidst all the chaos, I will always remember him saying these words. I got you. I got you. When that sinking feeling comes, remember those words. Because that's what Jesus is saying to us today. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Lord, I am with you always. Simply put in today's crude translation, God is watching you over you, protecting you. And today, if you ever struggle with doubt, He's saying to you, I got you. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. I got you. If you're not a believer today, perhaps you are experiencing the emotions I've described. There is an answer to overcoming those feelings. It's by being the one who can make you new, who can change your life. It's believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. But if we allow the evil one to cause us to focus on our troubles and control our emotions, it will surely bring doubt and sorrow. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to help us remember who God is and what God has done, we will be singing a song of praise and thanksgiving. Remember, God can move us from feelings to facts. Here's a simple yet powerful solution to dealing with doubt for me. One is acknowledge God, believe God, trust Him. When you're going through doubt, acknowledge it, believe it, trust it. I just want to end with a few scriptures I hope that will help you guide your memory. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5 is one of the verses that has been a very important part of my life. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On contrary, they have divine powers to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And this is what I hang. We take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You want to defeat doubt? Take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. I remember I was talking with my grandson about decision making. And he says, how, how, how do you make decisions? Sometimes it's hard to know what to do. And so I said, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you ask yourself, what's the wrong thing to do? And don't do it. <laughs> right? I don't know what the right thing to do is. Okay, what's the wrong thing to do? Don't do that. <laughs> Take that thought captive. Turn it around to be obedient to God. Philippians 4, 8, 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen, Put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. That's how you overcome doubt. Hebrews 13, 5. Never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. Matthew 28, 20. Surely I am with you always to the end of the age. The message of hope for those who are down is the Lord saying to you, I got you. I got you been a rough two years but I got you it is my prayer for each of you that when those moments come when you have that sinking feeling when things to be spiraling out of control when you're depressed or in despair when you're overwhelmed and feel defeated that you will learn to use God given gift of memory to lift you up and allow you to see God the great I am who cares for you 
and is faithful to you and will never, ever leave you or forsake you. Let's pray. Father, you are our present help in the time of trouble. There is nothing we cannot overcome with the help of your Holy Spirit who will guide us to the truth, who will give us the courage we need to be faithful and true. Thank you for the words of the psalmist. So accurate depicts our frustration, but at the same time, so accurately depicts our hope and our faith and our trust in you. Be with us, Lord. For those times of doubting may come, but we have a God who is greater than any doubt we may ever face. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.